Hi, welcome back to this series of videos about experiments in the digital age. This is the second video in a series of five. It covers material that's uh, included in chapter four of Bit by Bit. So in many ways, uh, experiments are incredibly prevalent in the digital age, uh, often in the form of A-B tests that are run by websites. And I want to draw a distinction between these kinds of A-B tests and the kinds of experiments that social scientists traditionally run. So you might call one kind of experiment an optimizing experiment and then the other kind an understanding experiment. So for example, when Google famously ran experiments comparing 41 different shades of blue to see which one would optimize the click-through rate, the goal really wasn't to develop understanding, it was to try to optimize a metric. Likewise, when a social scientist it, uh, runs a lab experiment testing an abstract theory of cognition, that is often focused on building understanding, but not necessarily optimizing any particular metric. And so increasingly though, what I would like to argue is that the best way to understand is sometimes to focus on trying to optimize. And the best way to optimize is often from having understanding. And so we're gonna talk in this video about ideas that can help you, uh, particularly if you're doing A-B tests uh, that are focused on optimization, some ideas from the social sciences that can help you run more interesting and more informative experiments. And so I think increasingly we'll be moving towards a world where we have experiments that are designed for both optimization and understanding. So a great example of an experiment and some of these ideas that can help experiments be more interesting and informative is this paper by Schultz et al. about social norms. So they were interested in studying electricity usage and particularly the uh, decreasing electricity usage through social norms. And so what they did is they gave, they ran a field experiment, an analog field experiment, where they gave flyers like this, not exactly this, but like this, um, to people where they showed them their energy consumption the last month relative to their efficient neighbors and all of their neighbors. And the idea was that by showing people information about the norms, the behavioral norms of other people, they might be able to convince people to reduce their electricity consumption. So they ran this experiment and here's what they found. So people who received this information uh, did not change their energy. The, the average change in energy consumption was zero over one week and three weeks. So it seems like a, somewhat of a failed experiment. I mean, no experiment has really failed if you learn something, but it seems like this treatment didn't work. But actually it turns out something more interesting was going on here. And so there were actually, these researchers had hypothesized ahead of time that this treatment would lead to two offsetting effects. So on the one hand, people who used a lot of energy more than their neighbors decrease their energy consumption, as you might expect from these theories of social norms. They also found, though, that people who used less energy than their neighbors actually increased their energy consumption. It was as if this information made them think, oh, I'm not using enough electricity. And so what you see is an experiment that looks like it has no effect is actually one where there are two offsetting effects in two different groups of people. And so this is an example of heterogeneity where there are what looks like a non-effect is actually multiple effects being uh, averaged together. So they were aware of this possibility and so some people in their experiment also got uh, um, information that looked like this. And the only difference here is that they've added this second piece of information showing great, good, or below average with a smiley face. And so the idea here is that they are not just providing a descriptive norm of what other people are doing, but they're providing an injunctive norm telling people what is socially uh, desirable or what other people think is socially desirable. And so it turns out that people who received this descriptive and this injunctive norm, it actually decreased the boomerang effect that they saw. So in the descriptive and injunctive norm condition, the people who are using more electricity than average still reduce their electricity. But now people who are using less than average did not increase their consumption. It was as if this extra injunctive norm information prevented them or made them realize that this was a good thing that they were using less electricity. And so here 
you see how this theory of norms helps allow them to design a treatment that would be more effective. So going back to this treatment for one second, notice what they didn't do. They didn't try to change the color of the bar from green to yellow or slightly green, or, or they didn't try any of these kind of little tweaks that you might see in an A-B test. By having a theory, which in fact came from a paper in 1990, it was a much more general theory, not even specific to electricity use, having a more general theory allowed them to develop a, a different kind of treatment that allowed them to make a qualitative change in what they were trying to do rather than just a series of A-B test tweaks. So if you wanna move beyond simple experiments in the way that Schultz et al. did, I think social scientists have developed many ideas that are helpful. I think three are most important and they are validity, heterogeneity of treatment effects and mechanisms. And now I wanna tell you a little bit about each of these. So validity. Validity is a checklist of ways that experiments can go wrong. And so, for example, it's a little bit like the total survey error framework that I talked about in an earlier video that kind of provides a framework for thinking about <clears throat> all the sources of error in surveys. Validity is kind of a checklist that helps you think about all the different kinds of ways your experiment can go wrong. And I think there are four main ways. The first is statistical conclusion validity. So this is roughly, did you do your statistics correctly? And so those issues are similar in the analog age and the digital age. Of course, there are some new statistical issues that come up in digital age experiments, but generally these are similar. The next kind of validity is internal validity. And this is roughly, did your experiment do what you thought you did? Like, were you able to successfully deliver the treatment? Were you able, was there some kind of information leakage between the treatment and the control? Generally, in, internal validity should be higher on digital platforms. That is, it should be easier if you're doing a digital failed experiment to ensure internal validity than if you're doing an analog field experiment. The third type of validity that's important is construct validity. And this is one that doesn't receive as much attention, but I think is very important and is also very challenging in digital age experiments. So construct validity is about whether the thing that we were able to do is actually a good operationalization of the constructs that we are reasoning about. So social scientists often think and reason about abstract constructs like democracy and social capital. And so if you want to do empirical work about things like that, these abstract concepts, you have to operationalize them. And so for example, if you want to test whether democracies are less likely to go to war, then you need to operationalize the concept of democracy. What does it mean to be a democracy? How do you measure that? That's tricky. Same with war. What does it mean to be at war? How do you operationalize that? That's tricky. So construct validity is about whether in your experiment you've actually operationalized the constructs in the theory well. And this is a really, really key issue and it's often challenging in digital field experiments because we're not able to operationalize the constructs that we want. So sometimes we are. So the Restivo and Van der Wright, uh, experiment about awards in Wikipedia, you know, the construct they were interested in was contributing to public goods and editing Wikipedia is a great example of contributing to public goods. So they had high construct validity, but in other experiments, it can be much more difficult. So one way I like to check for construct validity myself is just to remove all the fancy words and look at what the people have actually done. So if you just read the introduction and abstract of the paper, if you just read the conclusion, it will often be statements about the constructs. Uh, democracy, we do, uh, we've done an observational study and we find that democracies are less likely to go to war. So I like to ignore those uh, constructs and just look at what they've actually done and say, okay, countries that have these three characteristics are less likely to have um, encounters with other countries that have these characteristics as well. So I think that's a quick way to make, get a sense of construct validity. Does this experiment seem interesting and important to you when the constructs themselves are removed and you only focus on what was actually done? So the fourth kind of validity is external validity. And this largely concerns with whether this experiment is um, likely to see similar results for other groups of people or for other ways of operationalizing these constructs. So in the past, external validity was often hard to assess empirically. It was often assessed subjectively. 
researchers would look at an experiment and think, oh, I think it might be different somewhere else. I think it might not be different somewhere else. But one of the great things about digital experiments is that they're often substantially cheaper. And so if your experiment is, let's say, 10 times cheaper, then you can run it 10 different times. And then you can assess external validity empirically. So again, validity is kind of a checklist for all the things that can go wrong in an experiment, all the things that can threaten the causal claims that come from an experiment. And thinking about these are really important, important as you design your own experiments and also as you evaluate the experiments of others and as you communicate your evaluation of the experiments of others. So that's what validity is. Uh, the second idea that I think can help us move beyond simple A-B tests is heterogeneity of treatment effects. And so we saw a great example of that in the Schultz et al. experiment. We saw uh, what looked, uh, the average treatment effect over the whole population was zero, but that was actually two offsetting effects, one population where the effect was positive and one population where the effect was negative. So digital age experiments are great for studying heterogeneity of treatment effects because now we often have many more people. So if you had an experiment with 100 people, there's really not much you could do other than calculate the average treatment effect. But if you have an experiment with 100,000 people, now we can start calculating uh, experiments for the effects for different groups. Also, now we have much more pre-treatment information about people. As people are operating on digital platforms, we often know lots about them before the experiment begins. And so we can use that pre-treatment information to help us look for heterogeneity. In other words, in the past, social scientists have often treated these people as interchangeable widgets. And that was really all we could do because we didn't have enough people and we didn't have enough information about them. But in digital age experiments, increasingly we will have the capability to study heterogeneous treatment effects. However, there are, there are some bad ways to study heterogeneous treatment effects. And one bad way is to just split up your data into lots of groups and look for groups where the effects are bigger or smaller. And if you do enough of these splits, you'll find some groups where the effects are bigger or smaller. And this is sometimes called phishing. And so you don't want to do that. Um, there are ways of dealing with this problem of phishing. One is pre-registration, where basically you say ahead of time, I'm interested in heterogeneity based on electricity consumption prior to treatment. And you list all the things ahead of time that you're interested in. This is a way to prevent phishing. Another way to prevent phishing is with data splits. So you might, if you have a really big experiment, you could split your data into half, let's say, and in one half, you could try all these different ways of looking for heterogeneity however you want, then pre-register the heterogeneity that you're interested in, and then test it in the other half of your data, which you haven't gone through and fished through. So data splits and pre-registration are ways to avoid phishing, and there are other ways as well. Um, as I said, there are lots of new methods about automatically looking for heterogeneous treatment effects while simultaneously avoiding the problems of phishing. So a third area that's really important uh, for uh, designing more interesting, more informative experiments is the idea of mechanisms. So a good example of mechanisms comes from if we think about scurvy. So I hope that many of you watching this have never had scurvy, which is very fortunate because scurvy is a terrible disease, it makes your teeth fall out, it's really bad. Um, However, scurvy was a big problem for a long time for many sailors. As they traveled around the world, either to trade or explore or fight, many of them became sick because of scurvy. So governments and militaries spent a lot of resources trying to figure out what caused scurvy, how to prevent scurvy. And they found that by eating citrus, um, sailors no longer received scurvy. And in fact, this was one of the, the very first uh, experiments ever done was one that was designed to test whether citrus would prevent scurvy. So you might learn that reliably citrus can prevent scurvy. You might be able to estimate that causal effect, but that doesn't tell you why citrus prevents scurvy. And so it took much more research to figure out that the mechanism through which citrus prevents scurvy is vitamin C. Now that extra knowledge is very important scientifically because often we wanna know why things are happening. And it's very important practically because it turns out it's not easy to have citrus on a boat as you're sailing around the world, or it wasn't at the time. And there were other kinds of foods that had high amounts of vitamin C that were easier for them to transport. Also now it's possible to make a vitamin C pill 
which is even easier to transport. And so by learning the mechanism, both we help advance our scientific understanding, but also it's very practically useful to help condense the treatment and make the most powerful version of it. So that's an example of what mechanisms are. Now the problem is that most situations are not as easy as limes and scurvy. And so I think there's, there's this great paper by Green et al, enough already about black box experiments, where he makes this point very clearly. So although it's often the case that we think of experiments as black boxes and we often wanna open the black box to find the mechanism, it's actually quite difficult. Um, and increasingly there are experimental designs specifically to focus on understanding mechanisms. And I think the capabilities of the digital age help make these experiments focused on mechanisms uh, more likely, easier to do. And so in this talk, we start off with the beginning about talking about A-B tests and um, understanding experiments and how increasingly we were gonna wanna combine optimization with understanding. And then I've given you three ideas from the social sciences, validity, heterogeneity of treatment effects, and mechanisms that can help you design more interesting and informative experiments. And ideally design experiments that allow us to both optimize some metric or make some change that we care about, as well as simultaneously developing understanding. And the ability to do both of these together will be particularly important uh, as you want to find partners for your experiments. So in the next video, what I'll do is I'll talk more about making it happen, that is how we do these experiments. And I'll talk about several strategies that researchers can use and the trade-offs that are involved. But one of those strategies is partnering with companies and organizations uh, which allow researchers to work at a much greater scale. And so if you are gonna do one of these experiments partnering with an organization, it will be particularly important that you can design experiments that will often achieve both goals of helping to do some kind of optimization and helping to yield some kind of understanding. So stay tuned for the next video. Thank you.